They're leading us in music and worship. So our music should speak to our hearts and heal us, bring uh, joy to us. And uh, our music team, with what time they do have to get together and practice, and they uh, they bring us good worship, don't they? As far as in the music and, and uh, praising the Lord. So we appreciate you. I want to thank you. <coughs> Sometimes it's hard to get everybody together. There's always something going on or somebody's not feeling good. But what they do on every Sunday is amazing that we get to worship with pianos and, and guitars, harmonicas, and different things like that. So we should feel uh, very fortunate, Manderson. So we uh, read in I- Isaiah chapter 5, if you want to turn there. Isaiah chapter 5, we're just going to read the first three verses, and then I'm going to take you to another passage. This is actually called, well, in your Bibles, it might say the parable of the vineyard, but actually it's the song of the vineyard, because it says, let me sing in that first verse. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1, it says, let Let me sing now for my beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. Verse 2, he dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. And he built a tower in the middle of it, and also he hewed, hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. Now I want you to go over to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, verse 33. You're going to find that it's very similar. The first one was directly for Israel, the parable of the uh, vineyard, directly for Israel. Now, this is Jesus speaking, and it's for the time that he's in, and listen to the words. Matthew chapter 21, verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it, built a tower, rented it out to vine growers, and went on a journey. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves, the vine growers, to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and the vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Verse 36, again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterwards, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. Verse 39, they took him, and they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him and, and the proceeds of the proper season. Jesus said to them, did you never read the scriptures to stone which the builders, the stone which the builders rejected? <clears throat> this because of the chief cornerstone. Uh, this came about from the Lord, and it was it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse forty three. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And that's where the next group that comes in is actually the Gentiles come in and they take uh, the gospel 
The first one was to Israel. And then when Israel rejected Christ, the next vine growers is actually represents the church. And what will they do with it? Look at everything that the, the one who put the vineyard in offered. Uh, he dug around it. He removed all the stones, which I'm sure is uh, something that hinders vineyard growing. Then he built a fence around it to protect it. And then he put a tower in it. And then he said, go with and do with it what you need to do to grow grapes. And they were not respectful to it. But then you go to, and there was one question in verse 4, in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 4. And this is what the one who offered the vineyard said. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? God has offered us everything. He offered Israel, their, his chosen people, uh, everything possible to flourish and to go forward. And then when you go to the New Testament, sometimes we have to lay the New Testament over top of the Old Testament to see what, what's all going on. And so they, they have a parable very similar, and Jesus speaks about it. And this time, it's the same reaction. They did not uh, receive the vineyard in the way they should, and so he offered it to someone else, and that's where the Gentiles come in. And they're the next ones to grow, and they're also included. So you can compare these two, parable, or, uh, two parables. One is actually, like I said, a song of the vineyard. And this one's called the parable of the landowner, but very similar. So the question is, what more could I do? That's what God basically is saying. What more could I do for you that you would honor me and be producers in this vineyard? And the same thing is to us. What more can I do to show you my love? Of taking care of you. I've put a fence and a hedge around you for protection. I've taken certain things away that hindered your growing. And then I put in a tower to watch over you. Still did not receive it. What more could I do is the question. Sometimes uh, when you hear this question, what more could I do? It might be in a conversation that you might hear two doctors discussing. When they're at the operating table and they may lose the patient. And afterwards they go, what more could we have done? Or you might even hear those words as a family member speaks as their children whose life is being destroyed by something, something out in the world, an immoral lifestyle. They might say, I have bailed him out over and over. I'm taking care of his kids, their kids. I've bought them groceries. I paid their light bill to make sure they didn't end up on the street. And then the words come up, what more? Could I do? Oh, those might be the words of a man or a woman who's tried over and over to save their marriage. They might say, I've forgiven over and over. I knew they were doing this. I knew they were lying to me, but I wanted to make it work. And so I offered forgiveness. And with a broken heart, you might hear those words. What more could I have done? What more could I have done? Sometimes when those words are spoken, it's because we're genuinely searching out the matter to see if there's anything that remains. And God says that. What more? God is the owner of the vineyard. What more could I do that you would receive me and honor me? Is there any resource is there any treatment that we haven't tried? We say that to ourselves. Is there a doctor? Is there a rehab? Is there a marriage counselor? Is there something 
that I could do that hasn't been done yet. We say that too, quite often. And so I think we understand that feeling. The same as in verse 4. What more could we do? What more could I do? And then sometimes those words are spoken almost hypothetically, meaning you don't really believe that there could be possibly anything else you could do. Because you really believe that you've tried everything. What more could I do? Sometimes the truth is, the truth is sometimes, in some cases, there is a little more we could do. We could find new treatments. We could find better doctors. We could find better counselors. We could be more faithful in our spiritual life to church. We could be more diligent and read God's word. We could pray more than just in emergencies. We could be faithful with our giving and offering and seeing other people in need. We could be more compassionate. We could be more merciful. We could be more understanding. Or we can even apply it to ourselves. We could eat a little better, maybe a little healthier. We could exercise better. We could watch a little less TV. We could spend more time with family. We could pay better attention to post the speed limit. Right? If you're going to ask the question, what more could I do, you better be prepared to hear sometimes an answer. And it might be something that you don't want to hear because the truth is, many times, there is more we could do. But we have already decided how far we'll go. We'll only go so far. How far are you willing to go in your love for Christ? What more could God have done to show his son to us? What more could he have done? All of us, quite often, a lot of people, there's an invisible line that to cross it would cause pain, it would cost more than we're willing to pay. Emotionally, spiritually, physically, and even maybe even financially. But what is that line? With God, we should have no line. We should be willing to go as far as he calls us. We really should. The question is asked, what more could I do? What could have been done more? That's what God asks of the vineyard, the people of the vineyard. Actually, the vines represent the people. But they didn't produce. If it would have been a man asking this question or a woman asking uh, this question, would e immediately begin to think of the possibilities that were not explored or maybe the opportunities that we're not taken advantage of, or resources that we may have ignored. But this is not a man or a woman that's asking the question, it's God. What more could I have done to show you my love and what I've done to protect you, watch over you, and then I gave you my son, my priceless son, with no limit. He asked this because he already knew the question. He did all he could do. Isn't that what we read in the scriptures? He did all he could do. He didn't ask it because he wanted an answer from us. He asked it because he wanted us to answer it ourselves and realize he gave his all, he gave his most. He gave us everything for us. The same type of question came when he asked, in the same way he asked Adam, where are you? 
Actually, he wanted Adam to think, where am I at with God? And the question to every one of us here and every person that draws breath on God's green earth is this. What more could God have done to save you? He sent prophets to warn Israel. He's given us scriptures to warn us. To heal us, spiritually healing. That deep void within ourselves, that inner need. He covered us with his precious blood through his son. Paid for all the spiritual costs there was because of his precious, pure blood. To deliver us, he paid the ransom. Sent his son to a cross to bridge the gap that separated us from God in our relationship with him. To set us free, he conquered sin and death and sent Jesus, his son, and then the Holy Spirit to guide us. What more could he have done? That's the question. What more could he have done? What more could he have done to give you life abundant with joy and peace? He, give, he gives us purpose for living And the answer still is nothing. He could not have done anything more. There's nothing more that God could have done. He had a perfect plan laid out for us, and we were included. There's nothing that God overlooked or left out. There's nothing that he left undone. There's nothing that could be added. There's nothing he forgot, and there's nothing left out. There's nothing left out. And I guess we can say as far as this, he crossed every T and dotted every I with his plan for us. And remember this, we're not talking about a good man or a doctor or a lawyer who in their own human ability always leaves something undone or uncovered or unused. We're talking about God, mighty God, our creator, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, he's the author and finisher of our faith. He is the chief cornerstone. He's the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. He's the great high priest. He is the lamb of God, perfect and spotless, without blemish. He is the lion of Judah. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is our hope. He is our peace. He is our redeemer. Those are his names. Sanctifier, baptizer, our deliverer, our healer, our mediator, our door, the gate. The one who opens the gate of eternal life for us. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the word made flesh. He's the true vine. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Those are mighty titles. And he is my savior. He is my friend. What more could God have done? What more could God have offered us so that we could receive eternal life and healing and to be delivered and set free to give us everlasting life who, what we had lost? He did everything possible. What more could he have done to keep me from eternal separation from our Father in heaven? What more could he do to make you love him and want to serve him? A lot of questions here, isn't there? A lot of thinking, though. He gave his most valued item. He sent his only son to die for us. On a cross for our sins, for our sins, for our troubles, for our actions. And then he sent us the blessed Holy Spirit to live within us and to teach us and to guide us and to comfort us and direct us, empower us. And so much more to the list. He gave us the living word to walk by. 
I ask again, what more could he do? What more could he do? That's what he said in verse 4 to these people at the vineyard. So let me ask you this question for yourself. If you have not chose to serve Christ, what is it that he didn't do to show you how much he loves you? What is it that holds us back? What is it that might hold the person back? What line is there in your mind that he didn't cross, that he failed to cross, that leaves you feeling justified to not choose Christ? When we reject him, we say we're justified to lie to him and lie to ourselves. That he hasn't done enough. That he has not convinced me. It's actually a a decision out of pride or a decision out of selfishness to not choose when we can see everything that he did. How are we justified to reject the one who created us and died in our place to redeem us and then to offer us eternal life, which we had no power to even get? And the Holy Spirit brings the question to us today. Why are you still living to satisfy ourselves? Why are you still rebelling? Why do you reject? That's what the Holy Spirit is saying for those who reject Christ. Why do you still reject? Why would you rather not choose? Why do you not devote yourself to him? Why are you still letting things control your life? Why are you still letting sin control your actions? If you refuse Jesus, you can either refuse him or you can accept him. But when you stand before God, and we all will, Well, you have to answer this question. What more could I have done? He's going to look at us. If you haven't accepted Christ. And you will have to answer. I don't want to be in that position. We may have a thousand excuses for not serving. Not selling out to Jesus but you really don't have one single reason. Because God said, what more could I do? I have laid it out in front of you. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Verses 10 and 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. It says, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As you look into the eyes of the one who left heaven to die on the cross... In your place, shed his blood for our sins, you will have to answer this question. And you and I, and every person born, will have to say to God, you did everything possible. And if you accepted him, you can say, I trusted you. I am with you. The rejecter will have to say, I have no reason. I have no justification for rejection. And then we will say, worthy are you. Worthy are you. 
You offered me everything. And I humbly receive it. And just like Israel in the other text, the Jewish people, they all have to admit before God, it was me, it was self, it was stubbornness, it was pride, it was rebellion. We rejected even your son. In that last parable that we read out of Matthew, he sent his son and then they killed him. Sound familiar? You can stand here today and say, I chose to sin, do it, and you can say, I can't help it. My flesh has this desire to choose the world. Our flesh does desire the world without Christ. But with Christ, Christ beats sin. Sin has no power over us. And that's the truth of the matter. That's why we needed a savior. There's not one of us who does right naturally. Sin works in our members, making us slaves to desires without Christ. But the good news, when Jesus died on the cross in our place, he didn't just die to pay for our sins. He conquered sin and the power of sin. We read these, well, actually, we heard them in Sunday school this morning. In Romans 5, 6, it says, we were helpless against sin, but at the right time, Jesus died for us. Romans 5, 6. At the right time, Jesus died for us. In verse 8, it says, we were sinful, and Christ died for us. And in Romans 5, 10, it says, we were enemies to God, but through Christ's death, we are now reconciled and saved by his life. Amen. And then go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 19. Read verse 19 and then we'll read verse 21. It says, namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Just like Sunday school, we heard that this morning. Think about it. He took our place. He stepped in. Propitiation. That's what that means. He stepped in to our place. He settled the ransom, the payment for our sin. Jesus did. He didn't just die for the sinner. He died as sin, to put sin to death. The sin nature in us, and he took it and gave us the power to choose right and wrong. And sin has no power over us, evil. Not only that, he put to death the old sinner in you and in me who loved to sin, and he brought to us a new life, a brand new man, created in righteousness. In verse 17, therefore, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, new things have become new. You're a new person. And God offered this through his son. The question is, what more could he have done? And I have nothing. He left nothing undone. He left no stone unturned. God Almighty stepped out of heaven to the earth. He who lives outside of time stepped into time, became a seed, 
entered the world through the womb of a virgin, and then he was born and walked this earth that he created for 33 and a half years, and then he went and let them crucify him, put a crown of thorns on his head, and they allowed him, he allowed them to spit on him, drive nails into his hands and his feet, and a spear into his side, and he let him lay him in a borrowed tomb and rolled a stone across the door. And he took the keys of death. He conquered death, the curse of death, and he kicked open the gates and let the captives free. The Bible says he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphantly over them. He conquered it, the power of sin and death. He conquered it. And then on the third day, walked out of the tomb, and for 40 days he walked, the earth proving that he was alive and that even death, hell, and grave could not hold him. And we've heard that over 500 people at one time saw Jesus in those 40 days. He conquered death. His disciples and the women that were also part of Jesus' ministry seen Jesus. Then he commissioned his church to carry on his work and go to Jerusalem and get the same power that he had by the gift of the Holy Spirit and spread the gospel of truth across the world. What more could he have done? What more could he have done to make this happen for us? Because he loved us. Because he showed grace and mercy on us. Really, the question today is, what are you going to do? That's the real question. What are you going to do with what I just shared? What are you going to do with the gift of life that Jesus has brought you, the restoration, the reconciliation, the repaired relationship between us and the Father. And then he commissions us to go out and carry his good news. What are you going to do is really the question. What are you going to do with Jesus? There's only two answers. You're either going to accept him and give him your life, follow after him and love him and cherish him, or you reject him. You reject him. It's a love choice. It's free will. It's your choice. It's a gift. But what are you going to do with what God has done for us? We can't, we can't go both ways. You either accept him fully or you reject him. It talks about it in Revelations 3, 15 and 16 about those who try to live lukewarm. They seem to be like Christians, but yet when sometimes people see them living like the opposite. And that's lukewarm. And it's very confusing. It's not a good witness. And, he, and God even hates that more. He would rather have you cold and reject him, or he would rather have you hot. And those who live lukewarm for the Lord are confusing a lot of other people out there. Because they're saying, oh, I guess being a Christian, you can still do this and that and that and this. And so it's very dangerous to the true story, the true message. And that's when the vineyard creates wild grapes. You can't tell what they are for sure. So the question is, what are you going to do with it? Some of us have heard this over and over. And we're still undecided sometimes. And Jesus is saying, did I not prove my love to you over and over and over and over? And what are we going to do with it? I think this is what he wants. I just think we need to give everything completely to him who gave everything completely to us. Sounds like a fair deal, doesn't it? Serve him totally. And I don't think I'm the only one who's dealt with living two sides 
but we can get away from that and commit and walk right. And I haven't even scratched the surface of what God really has done for us. He's done so much for us. But the question now is, what are you going to do for him? And how many today would agree he deserves our best? Because he gave his best. He gave his best. And we need to surrender our hearts, our voices, and tell God, you can have all of me. Tell him that you want that new life. Tell him that you want to live for him. That you want to be cleansed. You want to receive that gift of salvation. And then tell him that you want the Holy Spirit to guide you, direct you, and walk with you, and to flow through you. Tell him you realize today that he's done everything that he can do, and now it's my turn to follow you. And that's what the gospel's all about. He won't force you. He won't make you. It's free choice, free gift that he's given us. But he does call us to live a life similar to his, to represent him and to walk like him. And I don't want to be one who's confused others of what it truly looks like to walk for Christ anymore. I want them to see me as hot and hot after Christ not lukewarm, but that I serve a risen Savior and I am committed to him. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We take the Old Testament and see where we can lay it right on top of the New Testament. Some of the same words of warning, but yet warning of love that you have love for us, that you have mercy for us, that you have grace for us, that you have redemption to offer us. Reconciliation calls us back into your family. And our honor to you would be to live as your example that you've given us. What are we going to do with it? It's really the question, what are we going to do with it? And what more can I do? show that I live for Jesus. And I'm going to go out and do a bunch of more stuff, but I'm going to do exactly what you call me to and what you have for me to do. Not extra things to try to gain your love, because I know you love me, but that it would honor you and respect and give you the praise and give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.